Thank you everybody for joining us uh, this afternoon. I hope you guys all had a long and uh, restful weekend, long weekend. Um, I'm super excited for today because we have with us Robbie T, who is the absolute man when it comes to lead conversion, how to say the right things, how, in, in what order to say those things, when to say them, why to say them. And um, he's somebody that we've been working with for many, many years. Uh, the, the, the knowledge, the valuable information that he provides to our agents is invaluable and is so, so, so impactful to what we do as far as increasing our lead conversion. So uh, with that, I want to introduce Robbie T officially. Colton and Robbie, you guys take it away. Awesome, brother. Thank you so much. Yeah, we, uh, again, so sorry for the slow start here and why we got that screwed up, but um, we're getting it fixed here. Um, I want to give, so kind of a couple things of kind of the outline of how we're going to go ahead and start this. Um, we are very shortly going to hit on uh, a couple of the key points that are super important for us to have what Robbie's done for us. We have literally been able to double our lead conversion for every single year since we began working with them. And the reason that we've been able to do so is just because the methods that he teaches are highly effective. Um, one of the cleanest, easiest, most simplistic forms of what he's done for our team and how we've done this um, is the organization. But one of the big things that we see teams constantly messing up is just the organization. And the reason why that's so incredibly important is if I were to give a thousand leads to Robbie T., who is by far, he worked in, how many phone calls did you make, Robbie, in your entire career? Way too many. Uh, well over 100,000. Yeah. I mean, the guy, he was one of the top ISA, is, in my opinion, the top ISA in the country. I think you would be hard pressed to find anybody who has set more appointments and had more closings as a result of that. The organization of the CRM by far is the thing that people get the most wrong. And when it seems super mm -hmm. simplistic and like that wouldn't be it, if I were to give Robbie T, who's one of the best converters in the world, access to our CRM, or I'll call it the perfectly run and organized CRM in comparison to your typical agent CRM, even one that an agent might have reasonably organized and reasonably put together, mm -hmm. Robbie T, with the same exact time block, with the same exact time that he spends uh, following up with leads, nurturing leads, he will be a thousand times more productive and effective with the exact same time if his CRM identifies a couple of things, one of which is going to be the commitment level of that prospect. How committed mm -hmm. is a person? Are they committed to us? Have we met with them? Have we not met with them? Is it somebody who's we intend to do business with in the future, but we've yet to meet? All of these things have to be super clear in addition to time frame. So again, <laughs> super simplistic, very basics. But are they looking to transact within the next zero to 30 days? Are they looking to transact within the next uh, 31 to 90? Are they 90 to 180 days? Are they 180 days plus? These are all things that we need to know because if at the end of the day, I tell Robbie today, your life depends on your ability to bring us a transaction today. Who are you mm -hmm. going to spend and focus your time on first? And most agents, and the reality of it is, they don't know the answer to that question. So by having the client's commitment level, for us in our world, a prime means somebody who is committed to us. An active in our world means somebody who we've met. And a qualify is somebody who we intend to try to do business with in the future, but we've never met. So he has the ability, when you look at that organization of that CRM, he then can go and look at them by their commitment level and say, okay, obviously the people who are primes and committed to us, looking to transact within the next zero to 30 days, are gonna be the very first people that I'm going to call because those are the people that I know are committed and that are closest to a transaction. And then he can go to active. Those are people who have met with us, but they're not committed to us. Having the ability for us to say, okay, they've at least taken that step in the pipeline to wanna to meet with us is gonna give us a far better ability to convert that person than somebody who we've never met, which is a qualify in our world. And this will correlate, you guys can create the exact same parallels within your CRM. But if I give him two hours to create a transaction, is he going to have the better ability to do so in a CRM that's organized in that way or a CRM that's organized really very half-assed like what most of us and what we always had? And it was none of those mm -hmm. things were clearly identified and it made the biggest, best difference. And Jamie, yeah, we do use Sierra, um, but if, whether you use any CRM 
they all give you guys these the same basic capabilities. Um, so organization, mm -hmm. super key point, we will send you guys kind of the basic breakdown of how we organize our CRM within our world. I strongly mm -hmm. recommend if there's anything you do before you implement any of the actionable items Robbie's going to teach us, that you guys spend time to completely go purge the CRM, which is a total pain <laughs> in the ass, but you spend time to reorganize it and that you have the discipline to continue keeping it organized with whether you're a solo agent, whether you're a micro team, whether you're a mega team, whatever it is, you have to constantly have that reinforcement and that discipline to keep the pipeline clean and to keep it organized. Because I firmly believe, and not believe, but know for a fact, we could all see 100% growth if we simply started to convert half of the leads that you're currently failing to convert. Mm -hmm. And we've proven it time and time and time again. We always think the answer, and this is what we did, thought the answer was we need more leads or we need better leads. And it was never that we needed more, that we needed better quality. It's that we had to start being more effective with the leads that we've already paid to put together Mm -hmm. And to actually get an ROI by having a system that's going to build us a foundation and give us the ability to do so. Robbie, before we move on to really what I think is going to be the most critical, important piece that we talk about today, anything yeah. on organization, uh, the process yeah. there, and one of the biggest mistakes you see teams make? Yeah, it, it's uh, you're hitting on such a boring topic, right? Talking systems and lead organization is um i honestly don't think there's a less sexy topic to you know for real estate agents but i think it's incredibly important well, what it really comes down to is if you don't have a plan for your leads you're planning to fail and the reality is as far too many people's databases are literally a bunch of leads just sitting there in purgatory um, there is no plan there is no organization and in that case how the hell do you take action um, and, and how do you organize things? So I think that's the first thing. Um, that is almost everybody I know is your leads are just there. Um, and then you blame your agents or you get frustrated at yourself. But the problem is you don't have a plan. So that's the first thing. The second thing that I, that I always uh, talk to um, when it comes to lead organization is the whole point of lead organization is to prioritize your activities. Like if you're simply going to um, look at what we teach people to do, it's to prioritize some activities over others. What I mean by that is, for example, with uncontacted leads, in our world, we organize all of them into two different lists, low quality and high quality. And the point behind that is if my agents or ISAs only have a limited time, which let's be real, we work in an industry where our time oftentimes is limited. I want my ISAs or agents to take action on the highest leverage opportunities. And simply for them, what that means is they're going to call their HQ leads or high quality uncontacted leads. They're going to pour their effort into those opportunities before they turn their attention to the lower quality opportunities. It's not to say that we never um, visit and work our low quality opportunities, but we never work those before our HQ opportunities have been worked adequately. Same thing with follow-ups, right? We organize all of our follow-ups into A, B, C, or D. We kind of started this trend um, that a lot of people mimicked and, and, and so forth. And really the whole point behind it is we prioritize working our A follow-ups before our Bs, our Bs before our Cs, our Cs before our Ds. And the reasoning behind that is we all have a limited amount of time. We all have a limited amount of energy. And what it really comes down to is sometimes you have to do, you know, it's a whole idea. Uh, I'm a big Stephen Covey fan from back in the day. And so many people just do what is... Um, a lot of just busy work. And for me, you have to balance what is urgent and what is important. So that's the whole point of having a lead organization system is so you know what are the most highly leveraged activities? What are the things that matter above everything else that I need to be doing? Because when, when you don't have that plan, you don't have that laid out, you don't have lead organization, what ends up happening is you do none of it and you get no activity, nothing happens. So that would just be my two cents.
We've been, and just to kind of add to that, and again, it's the most unsexy part that people don't want to hear it because we always just want to see like, what's the system? What's the automations? What's the this? What's the that that's going to make me a lot better at what I'm supposed to be doing? And the reality of it is like half of our battle in improving lead conversion, improving ROI, being able to scale our lead sources, being able to do more with less. Because like when the market obviously did what it did in March, we were all terrified Mm -hmm. because literally overnight, we saw half of our pipeline completely step on the fence and say, I'm not buying affordability, interest rates, or don't ever call me again because I'll never be able to afford to buy in California where we were at. And it just became like this total nightmare. So like, shoot, what do we do? We just have to do better with the leads we already have. And we really got intentional with that. And we really started focusing on what we're going to go to next. And it's how we start being able to connect with more consumers and no offense to any of the lead convert that, well, I won't call them lead conversion coaches, no offense to any of the scripts that exist in the industry. But if you guys try to use any of these scripts that were literally available 14 years ago, when I started in the industry, they're completely ineffective. They do not work. They will not help you connect with a human being in a way that will gain knowledge, that'll gain mm-hmm. trust, that will help them want to be the person or to help you be the person they're going to think of when that time comes. They're Mm -hmm. cheesy, they're scripted. And one thing that we've learned with Robbie since working with him as our lead conversion coach is scripts only work in a controlled environment. They only work when we're sitting there in the office and we're role-playing and somebody says, you know what, I'm fearful of the market. And we use some cheesy bullshit to say, you know what? Well, if I could show you how the market's going to do nothing but appreciate and have the strength of the market and da-da-da-da-da-da-da. And then in the role-play, we go, okay, yeah, you're right. I will jump off this fence and I will buy or sell a home. (laughs) Like that <laughs> stuff just never works in the real world, but it's how we actually practice when people role play it in our teams. Um, so uh, before we kind of step into that, Robbie, uh, the only other thing that I want to touch on that you've taught us is how to be more effective in our actual prospecting. Mm-hmm. And one thing that we've learned and what Robbie taught us very quickly was a lot of us will claim that we are prospecting when we are following up with people that we've already met and who already know us and like us and trust us. And the reality of that is that is not prospecting. So we have become very intentional with separating our time to where the first half of our time block is making sure that we are spending it, creating new business, creating more relationships that currently aren't using us and don't intend to use us. So we spend Mm -hmm. it calling our not nets. So people who we've never met half of our, half of our time in the morning is used to make sure that we can pull more of those people into the next stage of the pipeline. And then the other half is the time that we use to be very intentional with the people who we have met and who do know us and who do like us and who do trust us, because by separating our time, we can make sure that we're not doing what every agent does. And it's having a really good couple months. And then all of a sudden we look at our pipeline and we go, shit, I'm unemployed again. I have no escrows. I have nobody serious. And then we start doing the activities that got us them in the first place. So when we're that Mm -hmm. intentional about being effective with our prospecting, and we mm-hmm. break it up in half, we can make sure that we're constantly filling that pipeline and then making mm-hmm. sure that we can create consistent business for us, our families, and for the people who deserve it, which is usually us. <laughs> well, um, and uh, Colton, uh, we, the simple tagline, um, you're calling it prospecting, we call it lead generation. There's a difference between lead generation and lead follow-up. And far too many people what ends up happening is we lead generate, lead generate, and then we just start doing follow-up and we stop lead generating. You have to consistently be lead generating. Lead generating literally means to create opportunities. And for me, the definition is, are you reaching out to your friends or family, those have not met, or are you reaching out to leads that you have not yet contacted um, and moving them either into your appointment buckets or your follow-up buckets. So I think you're, you're spot on, man. You, I love how you guys break it down into making sure lead generation is being done, not just lead follow-up. Yeah. So I know that is the super boring part, but in my opinion, it's one of the by far the most important. Um, now, and guys, please keep in mind, um, ask any questions in the chat that you'd like, because this next yeah. portion which is really the conversation. And when we do get somebody on the phone, how we're going about the process, how it's structuring, what the framework of it is, when we receive certain objections, how we handle it. And the one thing that I've loved about implementing this process that Robbie taught our team, 
is it's all pretty much the same exact objection handlers. It's the same exact <laughs> and cover more information. So it's a very simplified approach, but it is 10 times more effective than anything we've ever used before. So Robbie, conversation, you do a ton of team coaching. Yeah. Where are we all screwing it up? <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about um, when I got into real estate. Uh, when Eric had hired me, he had given me the good old script book as uh, I would call it, it was from at that point, I forgot what coaching company, but it was this big. And uh, Colton, I think uh, you and I can agree on this. You and I both kind of um, make fun of ourselves that we're not the smartest guy. And I saw that thing, I'm like, there's no chance in hell I'm going to memorize this script book. And uh, I actually just think we're two of the humble people that would admit we will never memorize all these scripts grips for all these situations. And that kind of put me on this radical step forward of, man, I can use a script book um, where I had to learn these scripts for all these situations because the situations were always changing. And I think the, the biggest problem is, is simply this, is we have seen an evolution in the way people prefer to be communicated with. And we've seen a power dynamic shift the last, honestly, 10 15 years in real estate, where real estate agents are becoming less and less gatekeepers of information, which when you are the gatekeeper of information, you control all the power. Well, with websites and you know 3D tours and everything that, that's happened, we control much less the information compared to what we used to. I think what we have to really think about, Colton, is we have to stop thinking about how do we outscript our competition, and we need to pivot towards how do we out influence our competition. And the reality is when you're scripting people, you likely weren't influencing them. You were trying to sell them some stuff that they didn't want. It led to buyer's remorse. And there's more accountability in today's day and age than ever before um, because of the internet reviews, all of it. Rather, um, the approach that, that we take is one where we're simply trying to gain a clear understanding of what people need, want, or desire. And we can give people some framework for this today, some, some actionable takeaways. So it's simplified. But we're trying to gain and understand what people's needs, wants, and desires are before we ever try to influence them. So if I were to simplify it all, you, you had asked, where are people messing this up? Where are we screwing it up? I think it's simply the idea that you think you have the power. I think we're messing it up when, when you're thinking that setting quality appointments is about what you're saying. And I actually think it's about what are you getting others to say? To steal from Stephen Covey, to steal from some of the brightest minds out there, um, Tony Robbins, um, just to name a few. The reality is that if you want to influence someone, we don't, or if you want to influence somebody, you have to find out what's already influencing them. And that's really what guides our whole approach is. We're not trying to sell. We're not trying to push. We're not trying to say, hey, go and do this. What we're trying to do is create a safe place where people feel comfortable sharing their truth with us. And by doing so, you will find yourself with a bountiful amount of business. Colton, what do you want to add? The one thing that I can tell you like that we've just learned that's been far more effective and when we listen to as many phone calls as we do now in our auditing for the leads that we give our teams and that type of thing, I notice and no matter how much we practice it, no, how, no matter how much we preach not to do this, people still do it and we have to be so insanely conscious not to ask questions that our relationship does not yet justify. And immediately yeah. we hear it, whether regardless of the type of lead, if it's a portal lead from Zillow, Realtor.com, Ojo, Veterans United, if it's a PPC lead, they don't know us, they don't like us, they don't trust us. And if it's a portal lead, they're just trying to set an appointment. And agents mm -hmm. like to ask all these qualifying questions to ensure that we are not wasting our own time. And it is one of the mm -hmm. absolute most killing things you can do. And it's some of the worst questions we can ask. And it's the deal killers. It's, uh, are, well, are you pre-qualified? Mm. Have you spoken to a lender? The people who require that they come in and they meet with you in the office. Like that stuff used to work back in the day. My mentor, my initial one, that's what they had to do. They don't mm. have to do that anymore. And our relationships have to get to a point 
where we can feel we can be justified in being able to start pressing clients for the type of questions and the type of information that we want in order for us to make sure that we're not wasting our time. Mm -hmm. And we'll definitely, we're going to touch base on kind of the process because the way that we handle it for our PPC leads and the way we handle it for our portal leads are two mm -hmm. completely and totally different conversations because mm -hmm. PPC generally is in the discovery phase. The life expectancy of those leads is dramatically longer than it is for mm -hmm. the portal leads. So we do have to be a lot more to the point when it comes to the portal leads, because it's somebody mm -hmm. who wants to see a home and our rule is set the appointment, find out what they fell in love about it. So we say, if they wanna take a look at the property, regardless of what time they ask, what time works best for you today or tomorrow to take a look at that property? because we just want to get the appointment set. And then we get that appointment set. One quick rule, please write this down because it's one of the ones that we struggle with with our agents. Make <laughs> sure that you send a calendar invite because when you do not send the calendar invite, your show up rate for the appointment will decrease based on our tests by 12%. 12% is a substantial amount. Sending a calendar invite is a really critical, important piece to make sure that when we set the appointment, they actually show up which for me, I'm the type of person, if I set a haircut with you and you don't send me a calendar invite, the likelihood of me forgetting is about 120% because <laughs> I just won't remember it. Good thing you had this in your calendar. You wouldn't have shown up for this. Ugh, dude, we barely got <laughs> anybody on. <laughs> um, so then we, once we have the appointment set, we always ask people and we're like, well, help me better understand what you loved about this property. And we like to ask this, and the problem is we change it, and we like to find out different things. And this is all super basic, and I promise we're going to get way more in depth here in a minute. But mm -hmm. this is where Robbie really set it apart for us, because these are things mm -hmm. that Zillow taught us, and Realtor.com taught us, and all these. We're trying to find out, help me better understand what made you fall in love with this property, what, what's interesting you about this property. And then we shut up, and we let them talk. <laughs> And we let them say, well, it had a big backyard. And Robbie will tell, tell us them about the, well, help me understand why that's so important to you. Mm -hmm. And then we shut up and we let them talk about their kids and their wife or their husband or their divorce or their physical ailments that are now preventing them from actually being able, like we are finding out everything that we need to with really simple questions, without over speaking, without answering for them, which we all have a habit of doing. And being able to write down and take super detailed notes so that if you don't talk to them or if you don't set the appointment, that we are going to be able to follow up that much more effectively. And then when they answer those questions, <clears throat> um, I totally forgot where we were at. Help me better and understand what you fell in love with that property. And then three, yeah. what other properties are on your radar that you would be interested in taking a look at? Not, sure. are there any other homes you want to take a look at? The answer will be no. Nine times out of 10, that answer will be no. But when we make those tiny little micro adjustments, mm -hmm. the improvement that we see for being able to set that appointment, because our whole goal is to make sure that we set the, the second appointment on the first appointment. That needs to be our entire objective. And there's going to be a framework that we follow to dramatically improve that, what we call a KPI, key performance. Uh, it's a key, key performance indicator. We want to yep. find out who's going to have the ability to actually connect them. Um, and of course, my webcam doesn't work now. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, let, let me, uh, while, while you work on that real quick, Colton, uh, let, let me chime in here for a moment because you're, you're spot on. So uh, let, let's just circle this back. Um, it's really unique because as Colton just named, what we're getting a lot of people to go and do is we're getting people to tell us the emotional information, what they love about a house, the pain points, the pieces. Um, I'll let uh, Colton answer what question number three was. They're naming the, the, the problems they're trying to solve. But let's talk where I see so many agents or ISAs go wrong. And I call this left fielding. I want everybody to write this term down, left fielding. It is one of the most awkward damn things that if you go listen to call recordings and we go role play, almost all of you do this. And what I what left fielding is, is let's say that Colton had came into uh, or we were doing a showing and um, we're having this conversation and Colton's telling me that he loves the style of the home. And I then say, okay, cool, really great. By the way, Colton, um, how many kids do you have? Or got it, Colton. What do you do on the weekends? What's the the extra 
extracurricular activities that you're doing. What ends up happening is that you pull these random questions out of left field that you've all been taught are rapport building questions. And here's where people have led you astray is this idea of building rapport is unbelievably overrated. Don't be focused on building rapport, be focused on building influence. And if there's one simple thing that I've learned is that in these conversations, if you are sitting there asking awkward questions like how many kids you have, and they haven't brought up their kids or they haven't brought up what they do on weekends, it is awkward as all hell. Rather, what I've learned about human beings is they bring up these things in little tiny pieces. All right, you all have heard this term, right? Buyers are liars, right? Right in the, type in the chat, okay? If you all think buyers are liars, type in the chat, say, I agree, or that's me, or buyers are liars. I am the host now, by the way, uh, of this bad boy. Yes, sometimes. All right, here's the biggest thing, friends. Buyers are not liars. You're like, dang it, this guy just trapped me. Now he made me look stupid. It's not on you. Buyers are not liars. We are just really terrible at listening and asking good questions. You see, the way people operate, think about this. When you're talking to a lead, you're a random stranger. You're showing somebody a house for the first time. You're talking to a lead for the very first time. You're a random dang stranger. It would be awkward as heck. It would be socially odd if these people just opened up and told you nothing but the whole truth right out of the gate. I would call that slightly desperate or chaotic <laughs> or psychotic, I should say. Rather, what we need to recognize is when people open up, people are traditionally giving you insights a little bit at a time. You see, people give you partial truths. If you go listen to any call, I promise you, we're going to read any text conversation with the lead, almost always there's partial truths of opportunities that we completely looked past. Things like, yeah, we're looking to get a bigger home because um, our, our family's growing. What happens is lead converters make two big mistakes. One is the left field, they pull something out of left field. And then number two, this is the, the second biggest promise we people make, is you make assumptions. We try to guess what people are doing. We try to guess why they were doing what they're doing. We try to guess and we try to be right. When the most powerful thing that we need to recognize is it's not about you guessing it. It's about you getting them to tell you it. So simply put, Right. Let's say we were talking to a pay-per-click lead, a, a forced registration lead, uh, which is basically somebody who went to Google and simply um, search. Um, oh, hold on, Colton sent me a, a message here. Um, Colton, I'll look at that in a in a moment. Um, if somebody was on a website, they just searched homes in let's go Irvine, California. That's a PPC lead. Almost always the beginning of that conversation is going to start with something like, hey, Brian, or hey, my friend, or hey, lead name. I was just reaching out because I saw that you were checking out some homes on one of our websites. And I wanted to see if you're just trying to looking for fun or you think about making a move sometime soon. And of course, the biggest problem right now is so many people um, have so many fears. They have so many anxieties, frustration, or frustrations, concerns. They're dragging their toes. They've seen affordability go down. And what happens is people bring up objections, right? What are the most common objections that you all are seeing right now when you guys are talking to leads? I'd love to hear them. Maybe type them in the chat quick. Some of the common objections. That hey, Robbie, called... why they're oh, doing yep. that, if you can, yes. I have people text me that they're locked out. If you want to make oh. me a host again, I'll accept them in. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Hold on. I'm trying to do that. We did a quick shift of a computer. Sorry about that. You're good. No worries, brother. All right. Home prices are going to drop. 
I'm trying to see how I do that. Uh, you might be able to click the three dots on me and then just say make host. Yeah, I'm trying to do that right now. There it is. I found it. Cool. Okay. There you go. Did that work? Thank you, brother. Yep. All right. Um, let's see here. Let those people in. All right. Same things, right? I'd like to wait till the end of the year. What prices have gone down? Home prices are going to drop. Not ready to buy. Waiting for prices to go down more. Prices will go down, so we're going to wait six months, right? This is actually one of my favorites. Um, and you cool if I just handle these real quick, Colton? Yeah, Can we just please. dive into this? All right, so um, let's talk about that one. Prices are going to drop. First off, let's just be very, very honest. Colton, do you or I know if prices are going to go up or down over the next six to 12 months? No. No. Okay. Stop lying to people. Now, here's the simplest thing, friends. Watch this. Colton, how long do you plan on staying in your home? Uh, I mean, we, we were planning on making a move a little bit quicker, but now we're going to just kind of wait, wait for things to fall a little bit or see how things go before we end up getting back into the market. Got it. Totally understand it. And what was causing you to want to potentially get something different, by the way? Uh, I mean, we were COVID. Uh, we got kind of everybody mm. who was working from home, uh, mm. running all over each other, all that good stuff. So... Got it. So your house just isn't a, a great fit for you and your family. Has that been frustrating for you or give me some more insight behind that? Uh, certainly hasn't been fun. <laughs> okay. Uh, what makes you say it hasn't been fun? Just uh, I'm trying to work from home. We're starting to transition mm -hmm. back to it a little bit, but we just need more space. So. All right. So let's just pause there because I think this is such a really good example, Colton, of how truths come out, right? You started with I ain't doing anything. I want to wait. While the reality is I want to ask some questions. And Colton, where did all of my questions go? To me and to why I wanted what I was running from and what I was running towards. It's simply it. Everything I have in a conversation is seeking out motivation. What are people running from or what are they running towards? But more importantly, Colton, what was I doing with almost every single question? Was I pulling questions out of the blue or what was I basically doing to your answers? Rephrased. I want everybody to write down this equation. Almost always, if you want to handle anything, if you want to build deeper connections, if you want leads to give you better answers, if you want them to tell you more, which is ammunition and leverage in the conversation, it is you understanding their perspective. You literally take their answer and add this to the end of it. Got it. So you're, you're feeling kind of cramped in your current home. Tell me a little bit about that. So rephrase and reflect what they just said. One of the main things, hit on it. And then tell me a little bit about that. What do you mean by that? What does that mean to you? Tell me more. Provide some clarity. You see, this is where everybody messes up, Colton. They mess us up so bad is we hear people say things like, well, you know, my, my house is just, I'm feeling cramped. Okay, I want everybody to write down this question. You need to be asking yourself consistently, what the hell does that actually mean? I want to point okay. this out because we ignored it for a long time. But when mm -hmm. we actually did this and we actually took, the, and this stuff you're not going to learn in this one session, it, it definitely is something that is a progress and it's work in progress and we have to implement it. But again, we constantly now catch ourselves assuming what it meant. I'm feeling cramped. Mm -hmm. And we assume it's because they wanted a bigger house or we assume they needed more space. But what we didn't ask questions on, like when we actually started doing what he's telling us and actually further investigating what it is that was making us feel cramped whether it was the in-laws that they already have and now the in-laws are moving in. But it's like we were able to find additional information that better helped us connect from where they're at and build the bridge from where, they want, where they're at to where they want to be. But we were constantly assuming what we needed more space meant. We constantly were assuming what we were feeling cramped meant. And when we finally mm -hmm. started investigating it further, you'll notice the quality of call gets 100 times better because people enjoy talking. And they yeah, they do. And what Robbie's fantastic at is the Colton, tell me a little bit more about that, saying my name. And it's like these tiny little nuances that will help you connect with people in a far better way that's going to mm -hmm. make them feel heard, valued, and understood. So, Robbie, please keep going. 
they they to to hit on what what you're saying, Colton. They need to feel permission to keep on going. Buyers are not liars. You all just haven't given people enough permission to continue telling more about what they actually meant. And two things. First off, you rarely, rarely, rarely will be right with your assumption. Even if you are completely right with your assumption, what actually matters is that you are flipping the script because Colton, when I'm making an assumption, who's doing the talking? Me. If I'm asking questions, who ends up doing the talking? You. The other big thing is this, Colton, one more thing I want to hit on. This is another thing where I see people go wrong, is people have what I call saved search conversations. Oh, my God, this makes me want to pound my head against the wall. <laughs> okay, holy God, this is a waste of time. It is the epitome of stupid in real estate. Sorry, y'all, if this is you, I just got to shoot straight. Save search conversations sound like this. Colton, how many bedrooms do you want? Three. All right, how many bathrooms are, are you thinking as well? Two and a half. Okay, that, that, that's really, really great. And, uh, you know, how much, how much square footage do you want? Uh, and it's something over 2,000. Okay, cool, cool. There's gonna be a lot of great options. Those conversations make me want to pound saint, okay? Because they, do nothing. They are closed-ended questions that do not help you build influence. Rather, let's flip it like, got it, Colton. So, so you're looking to potentially get a bigger home. Tell me a little, little bit about that. What's going on? Um, we just need some extra space. Um, got my in-laws moving in. Um, so having a single story is super important for us. Um, sure. Yeah. Okay. So, um, in-laws are moving in, um, needing some, some more space. Is there anything else that's really driving you to potentially get a, get a different home? We've got a couple of pups. So, I mean, if we were to try to, when we do get back into our search, we're going to need something with a bigger lot. Got it. Okay. And, uh, tell me about your, your current home right now is, is it well suited for the in-laws being with you or is that just, you know, not even fathomable? Quick note, guys, write this part down. Cause it's going to identify all your sellers in your buyer pool. The question <laughs> is asked, I, if we're going to pause again, everybody's like, well, I don't want to work buyer leads. There is over 40% of sell, forty percent of your buyer leads will be sellers if you just ask the damn question. Help me bet not, do you have a home to sell? Notice he didn't ask it like that. He specifically mm -hmm. said, no. I understand your current living situation because the mm -hmm. way I respond is going to answer that question for him without saying, well, do you rent? Do you have a home <laughs> to sell? Like that's how that, we that will ask and it's completely ineffective. And people just start sensing, like, you can already hear the difference in the conversation he's having with what they're having with other agents. So that helped me better understand your current living situation. Um, we're, we're in a condo right now. I'm not going to answer it for him. Make him dig. Got <laughs> it. Okay. How, and how long have you been in that condo, Colton? Uh, we've been in here probably now for just about two years. Okay. Got it. Totally makes sense. And just to make sure you, you own that condo, is that correct, Colton? Uh, no, we're actually renting it currently. Okay, got it. So, so you're renting that place. And so with all this taking into account, the pups, your, your in-laws moving in, give me an idea of what you're wanting in, in this next home. Um, I mean, it just needs to be, like I said, more space. We need to have a bigger lot, um, ideally a single story for the in-laws. Um, and I, it's got to be good school districts. Okay, so good school districts. Um, you guys have some kiddos then as well then, uh, since you brought up school districts? Yeah, I've just got one more in high school. So I've got once she's out of there, uh, I'm done. <laughs> okay, congrats. Um, that's uh, uh, quite the accomplishment. Um, all right, so that, that is all making a, a ton of sense. Um, and, and what are you thinking in terms of timeline, you'd want to do something, Colton. Well, what's a, what are you kind of thinking? What's your ideal timeline look like? I mean, right now that's been put on the back burner. Um, we're, sure. like I said, this is what we are looking for. The market change. We're going to kind of wait for, mm -hmm. things, we're going to wait for things to crash or see what happens. Got it. Okay. So you're, you're waiting for, for the market to crash. Um, how do you think that's going to impact you you know, with the in-laws moving in, it sounds like they'd be moving in the condo. How do you think that's going to impact your life, Colton? Um, I mean, at the we're okay with it. Like we're, 
it's not ideal, but we're also not going to get into a position that we saw our parents get into back in 08. Mm. So, as much as I would like us to make that move, it's just not something that we're really re willing to do right now. Totally makes sense. And, and Colton, if you were to buy your your first place, um, and we're gonna we're gonna, I'm gonna teach people a question here a moment to ask. If you were to buy this first place, how long do you, do you think you would stay in that place? Uh, honestly, I have no idea. I'd like to think I know, but probably the next seven to ten years, maybe. Who knows? Okay, so a while. And uh, you know that condo that you're currently in, Colton. Uh, what are you paying per month in rent? What does that kind of look like for you? About four thousand a month. Okay. And uh, have you seen your your rent go up by chance recently, or, or you know, when you first moved in two years ago, was that a little bit lower? Or what's that look like? Uh, yeah, we have. It's definitely okay. Gone up. Okay. Uh, how much has it gone up? Not nearly as much as I'm concerned. It's going to go down in value. Okay. <laughs> Not going to make it easy uh, for him at all. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, Colton. You have every objection in the book. Let's pause there for a moment, Colton. I want to talk what? about... Sorry, go ahead. No, you're good. You're good. Go ahead. I, I want to go because I feel so bad that we're running out of time. We will go longer. I feel bad for your guys' schedules. We'll finish this, but I know a lot of yes. you guys got it off. The okay. one thing, like, I'm not being easy because this is legitimately what we're all seeing. People who don't know us, they don't like us, they don't trust us, they're not mm -hmm. going to buy a house, they don't give a shit what your opinion is, because Uncle Jim, Aunt Sally, your brother, your cousin, your whoever doesn't know anything about real estate is telling you that you have mm -hmm. to be terrified of the market. Mm -hmm. And what everybody, what everybody was doing when we first started this was immediately we'd go watch Keeping Current Matters, and if you're not paying attention to that, do but you're getting data and educational information from keeping current matters. And the minute somebody would say that I'm fearful of the market or I'm not ready to jump into it, you would immediately start debating them with facts and educational information. They do not know you, they do not like you, they do not trust you. And we can say the right thing at the wrong mm. time and it will mm. fall on their fears every single time. So Robbie's that approach is. here, this pivot that he makes of where mm -hmm. he starts talking to people and talking about what we're running from and what we're running towards. It's all legitimate because he's now going to be able to uncover everything that we are looking for. He's going to be able to identify everything we were in search of. Mm -hmm. But we all know people aren't rolling over easily. And a lot mm -hmm. of them are, but the pivots that he makes in this conversation, the amount of people that we're getting from scared in back into the transaction by following these pivots is mm -hmm. huge. And it's saving us a ton that that I know without these pivots, we would have lost these conversions 100% because we were asking questions and giving them information that our relationship did not justify. They don't know us, they don't like us, they don't trust us. But now Robbie has spent now, instead of hitting me with all that information, and instead of diving deep onto all this information, he's found out everything that I need to know. Do you think we would have, it would be more appropriate for us to start having the conversations of what the forecasts of the market are this far into the conversation as opposed to the very beginning. Well, the and, is, and, to, and, and to hit on all that, Colton, that's exactly the point of it, is oftentimes by pivoting and asking questions like this, you will find some pain that is far heavier than the fear of the market crashing. Now, in this case, when you have an a-hole like Colton who just throws every objection at the book after one after another after another, what you need to do in this moment is you get to do the final trick we're going to teach you today when you run into objections, which is, all right, Colton, can I be a truth teller with you? Or Colton, can I be honest with you? And that's, that's the pivot moment, okay? Because up until this point, how much have I shared about myself? How much have I shared about my own ideas? Zero, right? It's been five, six minutes or a few minutes of all about Colton and his needs, wants, and desires. And then it comes down to the pivot of, all right, man, Colton, I, I got to be a truth teller here, man. And that's when you can do a couple things. There's one of a couple different options. One, you can point out something that is so glaringly obvious from your perspective that is asinine, like living in your condo with your high schooler, with puppies, with your in-laws. And another question I would ask is, how many bedrooms are in that condo? And if I had to guess, it makes no sense, right? I can be a truth teller about that situation. Number two, you can be a truth teller about the market. So many people think that the market 
due to media headlines, is falling and falling from the sky, that the world is coming to an end. I don't know about you all, but that is not true. In most places, we're actually still in a seller's market. It's just not the fake market of last year. Okay, It's not this Fed-infused market of a year ago that we'll probably never see again, thank God, because it was stupid. It is a normal seller's market. This is when you flip and you get to educate, delay educating and trying to persuade people, rather try to understand their perspectives. Try to, I always say this, your number one job is to learn their truth. Your number one job is to learn their truth. You have to hear their stories. Number two, you have to speak truth. You have to share stories. You have to be a good storyteller. And that oftentimes comes down to telling stories about what's happening in the market. The reality is this. Watch this. Colton, was it fun buying a home in Orange County a year ago? No, not at all. Hell no. It was absolutely dreadful. What are we starting to see now for buyers in your market? They finally have some of the negotiating power back. Buyers have power again. They're not getting raked over the coals, having to submit an offer with an hour. That was dreadful. You have to tell these stories that are appealing, right? Be a truth teller. Tell this to people. They don't know. And friends, stop acting like the lead is an expert in regards to this stuff. You live this every single day. Be a truth teller about it. But you can't do it until you've learned their truth. Here's why. If you're a truth teller without learning their truth, you simply come across as an asshole, okay? On the other hand, what's really funny, Colton, is people have always fallen to one of two camps. You're either really great at learning people's truth or you're really great at, at calling it as you see it, almost always, when you have to be good at both. If you're really good at learning people's truth, but you're afraid to be a truth teller, you're an enabler an enabler of bad behavior. Here's what I can tell you. Here's what I know is that what happens over time in real estate over seven to 10 years is what historically regarding real estate? Price appreciation, okay? Seven to 10 years. Don't be afraid to be a storyteller, but learn people's truths first. You have to. Does that help, Colton? Yep. So he made the pivot, he talked about everything I was running from. I didn't do it. He got the conversation to a point where it's more appropriate for him to have that educational conversation. That's where he talks about this truth telling. And then at the end of it, clients are still going to tell us to take a hike and I don't give a shit. I don't know you. I don't like you. I don't trust you. The reality of it is when we take these micro adjustments, you will slowly and you'll see when you have these conversations enough, you took somebody who in the beginning, we were 100% archiving saying they're not interested. We're slowly trying to upgrade them. We're slowly trying to find them motivated. We're slowly mm -hmm. trying to find out who potentially will be in the market in the future. And so I still say, Robbie, you know what? I appreciate it. I love you, man, but I love everything you're saying, but we just, we're, we're not getting to a point where we're ready to go. And something that we've added to this, and this is an evolving process between Robbie and our team. And it's mm -hmm. like, because we just learned there's more questions that we can ask because guys, the one thing that I want you to understand, and we see it because we have such visibility into this for our team, is 47% of your conversions will not happen until the lead six months old. But the reality mm -hmm. is people have extended their time frame and their timeline to transact beyond six months. And the problem that we have is we are not asking questions to be able to truly be able to deliver value and make deposits in these people for this six months. So when mm -hmm. we tell Robbie and we're like, Robbie, I appreciate everything you're saying. We're just not there. Before we were archiving that lead because we were trying to top grade them and only work with the motivated. Mm -hmm. Now we don't have time to spend with these leads. So when we start having the conversation, the one question that we've asked that has dramatically impacted our ability to add value is that Robbie, I totally understand. I get that you're fearful of the market. We weren't letting people be fearful of a market that they absolutely have the ability to fear, be fearful of. We weren't mm -hmm. allowing people to feel what they feel and we were telling them that they were wrong. 
And as a result, how many of those leads were we going to convert in the future? Slim to none. Mm -hmm. But so when we don't ask this question, you'll follow back up with them in six months and find out they already bought a house. The same people <laughs> who told you that they weren't interested, they were fearful of the market. So we added this one simple question. And it's Robbie, I totally understand you're fearful of the market. And frankly, I understand it. When the dust starts, there's a lot of dust in the air. When that dust starts to settle, and if you become more confident in the direction of the market, do you plan on revisiting your home search or would you plan on revisiting your home search? The amount of people that say yes, but they're scared is huge. Mm -hmm. And then what we have to do is then use that as an opportunity to be able to educate them. And when we follow up with them, we don't call them back and follow up and say, hey, Trevor, I see that you, uh, I know we talked two weeks ago and you told me that you weren't interested and that you're fearful of the market. How's your home search going? Like, it's the dumbest shit we can say, but everybody's saying. <laughs> yeah. and so instead, Trevor, hey, you know what? I was thinking of a conversation. I just was reading this article and it reminded me of our conversation that we had two weeks ago. I read this article. I thought of you. I think it's something that could be really be useful for you. And you send mm -hmm. them that article. You make a little deposit. You make a little touch. You do something that is going to make him go, oh, Trevor's not just some asshole salesperson who's trying to convince me to buy a house when I don't want to buy a house. Trevor's mm -hmm. a person who's trying to earn my business and be the person that I think of whenever that time comes. So mm -hmm. we're tagging it as scared. Tag it in your CRM as somebody who's scared. That's a bucket that you are going to go make deposits into. Mm -hmm. And when you tag them as scared and we go to continue to follow up with them, once a month, you should have it scheduled in your day and in your month to where you are going to find an article for you and your team and you're going to find something that would be beneficial and something that will provide some clarity and to make them less fearful of the market. Keeping current matters is your simple cheat code to being able to provide mm -hmm. them something that really, really works. And we've just uh -huh. seen these pivots be wildly successful. And as people become more confident and we make those deposits, you'll see the people who are showing a pulse. You'll see the people who are still interested. And it's just really helped us progress a ton of those people through the pipeline. Um, mm -hmm. And I know we're running out of time here. Guys, if you got to click off, it's fine. But I do want to make sure we give you the action items that we were promised. I'm so sorry for the way this started. Um, the conversations that we were asking is help me better understand. Uh, set the appointment. What time today or tomorrow? Help me better understand what had you that had you interested in this property. What other mm -hmm. homes on your radar that you'd be interested in taking a look at? When you ask mm -hmm. the questions that Robbie's taught us. Tell me more about that. And we uncover the reasons that it's all so important for them. We're able to take all that information. And ideally, our entire goal is make sure you set the second appointment on the first. So mm -hmm. when they give you all that information, and if they say, hey, no, not really. There's not any other homes that I'm interested in taking a look at. And you say, well, Trevor, I, I don't know if this home's still available. But I was showing a house around the corner um, last week to another client. And it has that bedroom downstairs you were looking for. It has that pool, that blah, 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 blah. Because you paid attention. Mm -hmm. You took really good notes. And now you're going to give them an option that they're not even aware of. Mm -hmm. If that home's still available, would you be interested in taking a look at that? And if they mm -hmm. say yes, we jump immediately into the MLS and we go find that property. And we set it up for them to go take a look at. Because now, fortunately, mm -hmm. we have inventory. If you can get somebody to have a second appointment with you, your likelihood mm -hmm. of converting that lead goes to the roof. Mm -hmm. and, and then when we actually meet with them, if they say no, I want to give you guys the final action items because all these things paired together have had the biggest impact. You walk into the property. I'm going to skip a couple steps here, but we're not helicopter parents. We don't have to watch them and do the whole Vanna White thing. We don't got to walk. <laughs> the big guys. Here's the kitchen. Here's the, kitchen. Yeah. Here's the <laughs> bathroom. Here's everything you already know about the house. We instead, hey guys, I'm not a helicopter parent. I'm going to be walking around taking notes of things that we might need to bring to the inspector's attention in the event that this is something that you guys would be interested in. And we've trained our agents to actually walk through and try to find things that are wrong with the property as opposed to trying to sell them on the fact that the highway road noise, when you close your eyes, it really sounds like the ocean. I've heard an agent say that before in a showing. So, <laughs> when you guys are done taking a look at the property, meet me back in the kitchen island. And we have an island consultation. And we say on a scale one to 10 guys, how close is this to what you're looking for? Not what did you think? Because we know what they say when you say, what did you think? Yeah, we liked it. We're gonna go home and we're gonna think about it. And then they hop in the minivan and they skirt all the way home never to be heard from again. 
Exactly. On a scale one to 10, how close is this to what you're looking for? They say a seven, got it. Sounds like this isn't the home for you. What would it have to look like in order for this home to be a 10? Mm -hmm. Because we want to make sure we're truly uncovering everything that they're looking for, all the motivation. We want to make sure that we know what that is because we do not want to leave there without having our second appointment already set up. Mm -hmm. So when they tell you everything that it would have to look like in order to be a 10, you're going to reuse that same approach that we used before on the phone call. And it's, hey, I just showed another property that was off market a couple of days ago. If that home's still available, would you be interested in taking a look at it? And if they say yes, which a lot of times they will and they do, Marcus, who's one of our number one converters in our team, admitted the other day that he was skipping this step. But one day when it finally clicked, he implemented it. He set four second appointments on the first appointment. All four attempts secured him the second appointment. You have to ask this question and do it the way we tell you to do it because it will have the biggest impact. And at the end of the day, the goal is just to get them there. So you use that property as the way to do it. And if they say no, then at that point, we go do what we all do. And we're going to go, of course, send them a list of other properties and we're going to try to connect with them in that way. But from the initial phone call, and we'll send you guys all the scripts from the way that we have the conversation, the way that you're trying to identify information, the way that we categorize people within the CRM, it is so critically important from the time that the lead comes in to the time you close that we follow all these steps because you will see your conversion rate double when we make sure that we make every single one of these micro adjustments. And at the end, one takeaway I really wanna make sure, and Robbie taught us this and its biggest impact, if you want to revive a bunch of life back into your database, send them this text. And of course, we will send this to you guys via email. <clears throat> and Robbie, tell me if you've got one that you like more. This is by far one of your best that works for us super well. <clears throat> uh, hey, Robbie, it's been a little while since we spoke. I was just trying to update my notes. Did you ever end up finding the home you were looking for? Or are you still looking? question mark. Don't change a word. Don't change shit. Robbie taught it to us. We played with it. We track the response rates on these and it is astronomically high. And then six minutes later, hopefully your CRM will build this stuff automatically. We just use Robbie's. It does it automatically for us. You guys can literally just go click this and build it. Six minutes later, send them a thumbs up emoji that says, let me know. That six minute later prompt has a substantial impact on the response rate that we receive. Makes it seem very human. Insanely effective. Go send it to every single lead that you have no clue what's happening in your database. And I promise you, you will have a ton of leads get back to you and respond with one, no, we got our plans on hold. Yep. And then Robbie teaches us, well, what had you looking at real estate in the first place? <laughs> and then we go recircle back through all these same conversations. But we use all these objections of, nope, I'm on hold. Oh, got it. This lead sucks. Or nope, uh, or worse, we already bought. And if that case, that sucks. But the people who are on hold, the people who are kind of waiting, the people who are affordability, then you just go back into the questions that we already looped all the way through. Well, Lori, what had you looking in the first place? And then they start talking about this, 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 and that. And you literally just recircle back through the same conversation. And you're going to re-pull people back through the same exact conversation, the same exact statuses, the same exact follow-ups. And it's crazy effective. Mm -hmm. Before we get him off of here, we had to rush through this. And again, I am so sorry that this ended up so screwed up. Does anybody have any questions for Robbie, for us, for follow-up cadences, timeframes, any of that good stuff? Just curious if you're going to send this out, the recorded uh, Zoom call to everyone. Yeah, so we'll send the recording. We'll also send a copy of our scripts. We'll send you a copy of the ghosting text that we send to clients, um, the what you can do to revitalize some life back into your dead leads. If there's one thing I can just tell you, make sure to follow the exact steps. The one thing we learned not to do is change the formatting of the questions. So when you <laughs> say, hey, just check in to see, are you still looking for a home or did you end up buying something? It's going to get a totally different result than what we first said. Did you end up finding a home or are you still in the market or, or are you still looking? And you guys will see a super really great impact from that. Mm -hmm. Robbie, I had a quick question. Sure. Yeah. Um, sometimes when it goes on our team from ISA 
to say me. Um, yep. They'll be super excited talking to the ISA. She'll let them know, oh, hey, you know, Trevor's going to reach out, so on and so forth. I don't think yep. I'm that unpleasant to talk to, but a lot of the time, <laughs> it they're just seemingly disinterested. Um, and it it's almost immediate from the time they pick up the phone. I mean, we had one on Friday mm-hmm. that was like that, um, trying to set an appointment with them and, oh, we don't know what we're going to do, you know, so on and so forth. Is there, sure. we tried maybe three weighing or her, Melissa introduced, she's actually on this too, introducing sure. them to me in a group message. What What's the best way for our team to approach that you think? You have to do a group message. Um, okay. What it really comes down to Trevor is, you're a random stranger and by proxy, you're, they're not open to you. Okay. Even if they trusted Melissa, yeah, they're not going to trust you. Yeah. So what you have to do, this sounds super, and, and these are one of the times where we have to care more about effect, effectiveness than efficiency. What's probably happening is you are walking into the conversation with this mindset of, I know everything you want to do because Melissa already told me, let's run. Yeah. You have to walk into that mindset of, I need to revisit the big things that Melissa told me because you are going to build influence and trust by revisit. I'm not saying you have the whole conversation, but simply by saying something like, so Melissa tells me that you're really interested in this. Okay. Tell me about that. What, what, what has you interested in that? Okay. So that's one big thing is you have to walk in there and you have to almost start from scratch. You don't get to carry the baton straight forward. Okay. What does help though is the group message. And a lot of people have been doing the group message dead ass wrong. And what I mean by that is <laughs> Melissa would send it to you, Trevor, and the lead. And I would just say, and you would respond, Trevor, saying, Hey, I'm super excited to meet with you. We'll see you tomorrow. That's pointless. Oh, okay. God. Yeah. What you, ha- yeah, I know, right? I, I, it's most agents, okay? Yeah. Do this. This one simple trick, I promise you'll change everything is okay. instead of, you can do that and then ask the question. By the way, hey, Trevor, or, or let's say, hey, Robbie, super excited to meet with you uh, later this week. By the way, Melissa said you're looking for uh, a pretty uh, pretty big backyard. Tell, tell me what you all want in the backyard. Uh, it doesn't matter. Honestly, the question does not matter. What matters is you have to keep the conversation going. And what happens when you do that in the group text is it's almost like it's transitioning to you yeah. instead of starting from brand new. So yeah. you have to view it as you were, you were bookending and you don't want to bookend it. You were putting a book into, hey, Melissa introduce us, bookend. You don't want that. It needs a transition to you. Okay, so, thank you. Does that help? Yep, that's perfect. That's definitely- yeah, cool. And uh, Trevor, because we, we had the same type of deal like the handoff is literally everything for it. Mm-hmm. Um, the calendar invites how the person on the phone with them, because sometimes like Booney, uh, he's on here, he has a showing partner. So Booney doesn't meet with clients. Booney doesn't show houses. He doesn't do any of that. We hired him a showing partner. And so he'll take a lead and he'll have to immediately transfer it off to a showing partner. And the best way for him to handle it is he's like, yeah, hey, totally understand. I'm actually not available at that time. However, my business partner, Marissa, she is available and she'll be meeting you there. I'm going to go ahead and send an intro via a group chat now. And then he'll immediately do a transfer. It's not weird. It's not like you're trying to feed him cough, like a little baby cough syrup. And like, Hey, this is going to taste like shit. I know it's not like what you want, but <laughs> here they got to do it. Like when you have that confident handoff, like, Hey, this is normal. This is our process. This isn't my agent. This isn't my buyer's agent. This isn't my subordinate. This isn't my lesser than me. This is my partner who's mm-hmm. going to be taking care of you instead of me. Like that transition and that handoff is everything. And then Booney from there literally is never involved in the conversation ever again yeah. until the important parts of the conversation for the negotiations and that type of stuff. So it's like, if that's not losing people and I say handoff 100% and shouldn't. Yeah. Booney big time. Booney big time. <laughs> well, then I got like, a question. Like, okay. Yeah. Um, So kind of two questions in one that I'm sure a lot of people get, but when somebody says, oh, I have an agent or I'm not working exclusively with anybody, you know, whoever finds me the house, that's who I'm going with. How would you respond? So Robbie, do you want to take that first? And then I'll be happy to say how we handle it. Yeah. So the first thing that I would say is I, for the most part, someone tells me that I have an agent, I I'll do one of two things. It depends on how they bring it up. But most of the time, I actually don't believe it. 
and here's why. How many, Colton, you can maybe validate, validate this for me. What percent of agents in your market have their buyers under agency agreement? There we go. Okay. So, so they don't actually have an agent, okay? Um, that's the first thing. And what that means is I'm gonna continue the conversation and spend almost no time discussing that agent. Um, so that's one pathway. It depends on how they, they bring it up. Um, the other big thing is, let's say it's like a Zillow lead or something like that. Um, and they bring up the fact that they have an agent. Um, I'll ask, well, how's the service been so far? And then I'll ask more pointed questions like, well, how do you understand what, why you're, you're reaching out to me and not directly to them? And almost always there's a pain point there. And that pain point becomes a wedge. It is, well, I reached out to them and I've turned back for three days. I'm gonna ask questions like, oh, is that normal? Has this happened before, right? In the market of yesteryear, the fake market, um, but you know, shitty agents be shitty agents in all markets. They just, you know, whatever they may be, you'll find some frustration and you get them to bring up that frustration and then I'm not going to tell them that we wouldn't do that to them. I'm not going to sell them on why we're better. I'm simply going to act like they don't have an agent anymore because she got them. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, that'll, be my, that'll be my opportunity because they're going to completely forget about them. Where so many people go wrong is they try debating it or they try doing it. I just try to find pain points. And if, if they're reaching out to Zillow and they have an agent, that behavior doesn't align. And I'm going to ask that question. And a lot of times it will lead to, to them. Um, sharing it. The only exception, by the way, is if somebody has a, um, a listing agent um, and I'll let Colton get to that one. The one thing Robbie just said, I've seen, I've watched Dr. Phil before and based on what I've seen, all those relationships started out super happy. And then inevitably, <laughs> <laughs> this is the worst <laughs> comparison to make, but it's just the truth. Like they all start really strong. Everybody's on first date behavior. And then on that yeah. sixth, seventh, eighth date, you start seeing the real personality. You start seeing the laziness. Yeah. You start all the quirks in a personality that make me go, ew, you're not for me. You're not the person I thought you were. And it's like the yeah. agents do the same shit. Your agents mm -hmm. are going to come out super strong. And so it's like, one, we don't allow that to be a deterrent for us because we will still absolutely meet them because the likelihood of one of our agents being able to steal that business away once they've actually met with them through the roof. And then once they see that your agent only sends stuff every four or five days, this agent sending me new properties every single morning at eight o'clock. Anytime mm -hmm. this agent's actually using their home hunter service that they described that they use to identify off-market properties that your agent wouldn't have access to, they're going to know the value of that because you're actually going to prove it to them and send it to them. And then inevitably, when their agent starts getting lazy and when their agent starts getting complacent and the real behaviors start coming out, we swipe in with our great behavior, first date behavior that we do not allow to dissipate throughout the transaction. And you'll steal people like that all the time. So let the other agent screw up. Don't use it as an opportunity to back out of it because I promise you there's so much conversion and not allowing that to be a deterrent for you. Yeah, okay. and I'll add, I'll, I'll add one more thing to that, Colton. And this comes from Alex Formosi, who if you're not following him on Instagram and you haven't read $100 million offers, get out there and do it. But you need to walk it before you talk it. And far too many of you in this moment try talking about why you'd be a better agent. Mm -hmm. Show them it walk it you asking them questions in that moment you showing up for them in that moment is how you win because you talking it, it's going to be just you're going to remind them of that soon to be ex of theirs who promised the world and didn't deliver so over deliver um and under promise and if they asked and they said hey morgan um you know what i'm really comfortable i'm working with my agent. i've known them for a long time they're just out of town totally get it if i were able to bring you an yeah. off -market property that your agent didn't have access to, would you miss out on that opportunity or would you be interested in taking a look at it? Most clients will say they're interested in taking a look at it. So then you can tell them, cool, I'll kind of walk you through. It sounds like your agent doesn't have a home hunter service. Let me walk you through what that looks like for us. And then we use all the, the things that are going to make people want to buy down. Off-market properties, foreclosure, short sales, opportunities where we'd be able to get a home for less than market value, our agent network, blah, 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 blah. And immediately you're going to have somebody in something that knows that you have something that their agent doesn't. And it's so insanely important. Um, I don't want to keep you guys too long. We could have, we had like another 30 minutes worth of stuff we could have given you. So again, I'm sorry. Um, one that we get all the time, the listing agent objection. First and foremost, I'm not recording this part of it. I'll cut it out. If any of you said, I said it, I will lot. I will say I didn't. Uh, 
<laughs> but it's kind of it's kind of true because Redfin won't allow you to they won't allow you to represent both sides. We just use one simple thing. It cuts it off every single time because the other shit you see in the old school scripts don't work. And it's hey, <laughs> um, no. So when they say, hey, Robbie, are you the listing agent? Robbie, actually, we're not the listing agent. The state of California is in the process of eliminating dual agency. It's always on the books. We're not really lying that much. Um, we're one of the few <laughs> states that still. <laughs> It's like the state of California is in the process of eliminating an agent's ability to represent both the buyer and seller. So instead they put you in contact with me because I'm an area expert. What time today works best for you to take a look at that property? It takes the wind out of the sail. The stupid bullshit people do with, well, you know, when you have a listing agent, they know that the listing agent will get paid twice. They know they're going to benefit. That's why they're asking for the listing agent. They know your objection handler for that stuff will not work. So when you take the wind out of their sail and say that they're in the process, and as a result, Zillow or Redfin or so-and-so won't connect you with the listing agent, you've taken the mm -hmm. wind out of the sail, we'll get that appointment, which is the only thing that matters. Mm -hmm. Bethany, yes, I will legitimately, because we did have to rush through this, and we truly <laughs> have so much other shit. Um, follow me on Instagram. If you don't, we will post another part two to where we'll go through more of the actionable stuff, and I'll post that on there and send out the invite to everybody. Yeah, yeah. I'm always down to come hang out with you, Colton. You know how it is. And sorry for the way I cuss. I do cuss. I apologize. I can't hide it and I've stopped. Crying. <laughs> I called um, shitty agents, shitty agents in every market. So yeah. for sure. <laughs> Any, anything else before we click off, guys? Again, if you got to go, we appreciate you. But for those of you who still have questions, we're happy to answer them. And Robbie, you may have to go too. So if that I totally hey, you're, get you're, it. you're good, bro. Yeah, I'll throw in a quick question if I can. Yeah, please. On the role play that you guys did, you know, and, and the guy, let's say he gave you a six month timeline mm -hmm. and, you know, you're going to bring him an article of value or you're going to bring him something of value. What does your follow up look like and how often are you reaching out to not be annoying or, you know, overstepping or sometimes it just might be hard to actually find a piece of value to bring to them? I would I, argue I wanna, that the, the yeah, please. Oh, um, yeah, so the, the first thing I would say is if someone ever gives you a six months timeline, friends, you always have to challenge it and, and ask a, another question. So um, a simple question that, that's one of my favorites is when Colton says, well, six months from now, whatever it may be, or when the market comes down, I'm going to ask the question and say, got it, Colton. Well, let's say that the the perfect home came on the market. That was a great fit for you, your family, your in-laws. And it just happened to be next month, but it was a perfect fit for, for you and all your needs. Is that something you would consider viewing or would you miss out on that opportunity? So I'm going to ask questions like that. <clears throat> I might also ask what would need to change um, for that timeline to potentially move up or move backwards. So I'm going to ask questions like that. Um, the biggest thing, and I wish we would have said this earlier, is every one of your follow-ups should be intentional and justified. And what I mean by that is you should have in there, like Colton said, you're going to send um, some type, you're going to schedule a follow-up, let's just say for a month and a half, two months later, or whatever it may be, you get, you get to choose. And you're now going to follow up and give some value about the market. Um, I think what, what you need to realize, I think the biggest problem, Fulton, is we think that what causes people to go and make a move is that information that we sent. I don't think that's almost ever the case. Usually the reason that they want to go and do something is something has changed in that month or two in their life. Maybe their in-laws moved in, right? Someone asked questions like, so when are they moving into the condo? And just imagine that, right? You, you all have to be smart here and every situation is customized. If I know that they're moving in, I'm sure shit going to be falling up a week later. Because Colton, can you imagine if your parents moved in and you had your pups, like F that noise. I'm trying to keep it PG. Screw that, right? Life changes. That's so rare for me. Life changes. And by following up, a piece of that gives you some insight into, okay, um, you offering value just happens to coincide with that life changing. So just, just my two cents on that.
I have a question if I can go ahead and ask. Um, yeah, I, yeah, go ahead. My internet kind of went out. So if you guys went over this, I am sorry. Oh, but don't worry about how it. How do you guys handle like when you have like a genuine cold lead or you have someone mm-hmm. that maybe was in uh, someone else's database? I'm a part of a team and my mm-hmm. like, broker assigned leads. They could be leads from four or five years ago. They could be a lead from a year ago. I don't have a relationship with them. And yep. I don't have any visibility to like, if they've been even genuinely looking at properties recently. So like, this is a dead cold lead. What do you do? Yep. How do you build that relationship? So um, Colton gives out, uh, he uses one of the messages that we came up with, which is, uh, and what was your name, by the way? I didn't see it pop up. Brian. Brian. All right, cool. Brian. Uh, good to hear from you. So um, the first thing I would send is something like, uh, hey, Brianne, um, just wanted to reach out. We're, we're trying to update our notes or our records. Um, and we know that a while back you've been checking out some homes. Um, and, and how do you, I think you, there's a couple different ways you could word this. It doesn't really matter. Um, I just wanted to see if you ended up buying the home. Or are you still thinking about potentially making a move? Or are you still looking to make a move? Um, I think that just going down that pathway it is one simple way to do it. It's the way to do it. Like, and honestly, yeah. it's one of the things, and I totally get it because we always had these concerns too and these apprehensions. It's like, well, I don't know them. They don't know me. They don't know they didn't talk to you. Like they really mm-hmm. didn't. Um, they talked to 40 other real estate agents. None of us are that memorable. And they do not remember whether they spoke to us or not. So we don't get any kickback on this. Hey, Robbie, it, it, and you always want to kind of use that like, Hey, this is uh, not the, hey, Robbie, this is Colton Whitney with EXP Realty. And I was just calling to check back in with you and see how your home search is going. Like that shit doesn't work. I don't <laughs> up on you if you do that with me. But yeah. if you do uh, hey, Robbie, uh, it's been a little while since we spoke and I was just trying to update my notes. Did you ever end up finding the home you were looking for? Or are you still looking? Or are you still in the market? Mm-hmm. Not the, hey, this is so-and-so with EXP Realty. And again, I'm recording this. I think we have to say something with our brokerage. You do you, <laughs> life, live your best life. Yes. It'll be great. But it's like, I want to say everything. I, the salespeople to get me on the phone every time. And I always laugh because I realize when it's too late, they're the ones that hooked me in and made them think that it was me. Go call one of your best friends today and tell me you go, hey, it's Colton. You don't use that inflection. So cut that yeah. shit out. Don't do it. You don't use that cheesy bullshit voice that everybody uses when they do follow up. So cut that stuff out and stop doing it. The more familiar you sound, record yourself, listen to a phone call when you call your best friend, then listen Mm -hmm. to yourself when you call a lead. It is garbage. You got to mirror those and you need to make that tonality sound the same. So it's authentic to you and how you sound. And by the way, if that's how you sound, do it. But that's not how I sound. That's not how any of our agents sound. That's not how any of us sound. So Mm -hmm. make sure you're just mirroring and matching the same way you would when you communicate with your kids, your friends, your family. It's like, that's how you should be connecting with somebody and what's going to keep them on the phone to answer that question. Well, and I want to add just one more thing to this um, to answer the question. A lot of times we think that we need to have a lead search data or that we need behavior of a lead. None of it matters. Okay. And here is simply why. No one who's looking for a home looks at homes on one website. Not one person. They don't just look on Zillow. They don't just look on Realtor.com. They don't just look on Redfin. They sure as shit don't look just on your website. These people are all over the place. And you need to stop acting like a lead that doesn't have any activity on your site is a bad opportunity. There's actually almost no correlation between lead activity lead behavior and whether they're looking to do something because people are not monogamous to your damn website. Stop acting like it. All right. These people are all over the place. Um, Rather just, and and sometimes just name it. Hey, you know, we we had connected. Like if you're, if one of your team members had dropped the ball, people always ask me, well, what do I do to kind of repair it? Own it. Hey, we dropped the ball. Or, you know, we, we had been communicating a while back. I haven't heard for a while. Almost always the best dang thing you can do is just speak the truth. Short, direct, and then ask a question about where they're at right now. 
Okay, then I have one, one, sorry, I have one more follow-up question with that. So kind of, of course. you know, when you have a lead and let's mm -hmm. say that they were responsive three months ago and now they just fell off the face of the earth, you know, they're yeah. ghosting, whatever. Is it just kind of the same thing where you guys would recommend following up and saying, hey, um, you know, I'm just updating my file. I was just checking in, touching base to see if you're still in the market. Yeah. Have you ever heard of our aliens message? <laughs> okay, this is going to be the dumbest sounding thing. Trust me, I created the damn thing and I'm telling you, it sounds stupid as all hell, um, but it works. So you send a text saying something like, hey, Brian, uh, it's Robbie following up again. Um, and I've tried reaching out a bunch of times and I haven't heard anything back. This tells me one of three things. One, you're no longer interested in making a move. Two, you're still interested, but you've been too busy to respond. Or three, you've been abducted by aliens. In that case, let me know and I'll reach out to Elon Musk to reg re or schedule a rescue mission. And this thing gets a good 25 to 30% response rate of the people that you're saying that just ghosts and ghosts and ghosts you. Um, we've created other versions. If you don't want to do aliens, you can do a um, number three, you're stuck in line at your local DMV. And what we do is we send out a GIF with it, um, the GIF from Zootopia on the DMV one, a GIF of the aliens from Toy Story on the aliens one. We've also done other versions of your loss on an island. So stuff like that. There's a couple that he did in this one. It's like the fishy when she's telling Oh, Dory. <laughs> Forgot about that You one. guys, this is shit that literally, when I first saw it, I almost like, it was like, I'm, I'm firing this guy. It's my lead conversion coach. I'm canceling the system. This is the dumbest shit. I'm not using it. And oh my God, me, I know. responses, it gets the best responses. Mm. People laugh at my idea all the time. She's like, okay, that was clever. Sorry, I haven't gotten back to you. We kind of put our plans on hold. Boom, we got an opening. It just worked. Um, another one that we use the guilt one that's been really successful for us. It's like, hey, um, Lori, I don't want my follow up to become a nuisance, but I also want to ensure we don't drop the ball. Are you still planning on making a move? Uh, did you already find a place? Or are you still thinking of making a move? Like the guilt mm -hmm. one gets people all the time to say, hey, I'm so sorry I haven't gotten back to you. The thing is, and this is where everybody chicken shits out, is you're going to send one or two of these mm -hmm. and you're going to be done. And you're like, oh, no, they're not interested. I'm not make this shit automated because the, the automation will not chicken out. You will automate these texts until they respond. And we have a rule here. If I get a call and they say, if you don't get this guy to stop calling me, I'm going to file a restraining order. They should get a bonus because all your conversions are on the other side of your ability to get over the fact that, well, what if I annoy them? Well, what if you don't? And they end up with some other piece of crap agent who's not going to be able to represent them the same way that you can. When we shift our mindset to like, look, they deserve my attention. They deserve my focus. They deserve my ability. They deserve my skill set. And if I don't follow up with them, they're going to end up with a lesser than agent. Just change your mindset on it and send the damn messages. We'll send you guys our 10 ghosting scripts. I feel bad. I'm going to send you guys a ton of shit that you can implement. Um, but we'll get all that stuff sent to you guys. We have 10 of them. We have a bunch of uh, um, like ghosting messages and then also dead lead messages. And they're just crazy effective if you use them in sequence. And if six minutes later, you do the let me know with a thumbs up, like it just, it, it's crazy effective. So don't be scared that people are going to get annoyed. And then one person will come back and I get these calls all the time because they'll sign up with this stuff. And like this person just responded back that I'm unprofessional and they won't, they, they don't want to work with me anymore. It's like, dude, that's one out of 55,000 messages that we sent. Get over it. They're not your client anyway. It's the one that do respond that it creates that open door for them that it becomes effective. They were never going to work with you anyways. And it's usually a realtor being a douche anyway. <laughs> yep. Facts. Facts. Look up their names. <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys so much. Again, I'm so sorry for this horrible production. <laughs> it's my fault, not Robbie's. Uh, but we'll go ahead and get these sent. Ollie's going to package this stuff together, send it to your emails. We will get a part two scheduled here shortly. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys there. Thanks, Thank Colton. So Love you, brother. See y'all. Thank you, guys.